so much for being here with me this morning. My name is Ajelle Wade, aka The Toy Coach, and I'm thrilled to be here with you today. We're going to talk about unlocking creativity. I'll get right, let's get right into it because I explain it all in this presentation. So I like to start off uh, my conversations asking a question to the audience. And one of my favorite questions is, what toy blew your mind as a kid? And this is a situation where I really just want you to shout it out to me. Tell me, like, what toy blew your mind as a kid? What comes to your mind when I say that? Speak and spell. Lego, speak and sil spill, spell, sign and sell, Simon says? Transformers, definitely, all good ones. Mine, if we go to the next slide, you'll see is Polly Pockets. I was obsessed with Polly Pockets. I used to set them up in my um, dining room table. I would set them up like a little neighborhood. And the Polly Pocket you see on the far right was my absolute favorite. It was a teacher Polly. Um, I like to <laughs> literally set up a whole neighborhood and ca get all the kids from all the houses in my neighborhood and bring them to the teacher's house. And we would have, we would have Polly class but you'll see how that relates to all the things I do today as we move on to the next slide. But I want you to think about why did you love that toy so much? If it was Transformers, if it was Simon Says, if somebody here maybe had a kid that loved Tickle Me Elmo, what was it about that toy? Was it the color of it? Was it the features of it? Was it um, like how that toy made you feel? I bet you interacted with dozens of toys throughout your childhood, if you're lucky, maybe hundreds. And what was it about that one particular toy that stood out to you? So I want, I'm, I want to say that likely that toy stood out to you because um, it gave you a certain experience, an experience that you remember and you hold with you to this day, whether it was a real experience where I was like being a teacher before I could like kind of be my own teacher, or if it was an imaginary experience, maybe it was like your Transformers and you were imagining that you were a Transformer and you kind of creating a world like that. The most innovative products and brands out there today are notorious for creating these meticulously designed experiences. So before I keep going, I want to take a little bit of an attendance. I want to know who I'm talking to. So just raise your hand if this applies to you. Would you call yourself an educator? Oh, well, OK. Maybe I should have put that last. That was a good one. OK, creative entrepreneur. Do we have any of those here with us today? Just a few. OK, people are like, I'm not sure. Um, do we have any children's book authors or wannabe children's book authors here with us today? She's like, I want to be one, OK. Do we have any artists? Do we have any parents? Okay, I love that. So you guys are the key to my industry, the toy industry. Let me tell you about what we're gonna do today. We are gonna talk about my journey in the toy industry, how I came to be who I am today, the toy coach. Um, but then I'm gonna tell you what helped me achieve those successes, and it's something called the zone of toy genius, and I'm gonna help you find yours because I think that you have something the toy industry needs, so we're gonna talk about that. At the end, I'm gonna, talk, I'm gonna teach you what I teach my students, which is three steps to unlocking their greatest ideas. You can apply this to the toy industry, you can apply this to products, Honestly, you can apply this anywhere. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna point out some ways in which we can apply this to education, so don't you worry, you don't have to do all the hard work yourself. Oh yeah, so let me introduce myself a little bit more. So my name is Ajelle Wade, AKA The Toy Coach. Um, I'm a New York-based salsa y bachata dancer. I love to travel. Europe is my favorite. Honestly, I wanna live in Madrid if my fiance will let me, but he really like loves his family, so I appreciate that. So we're not leaving New York anytime soon. Um, <laughs> so I'm a three times patented toy inventor, an entrepreneur now, and I've developed over 500 products. I've had people say like, what? You're so young. Look at that flawless skin. How could she possibly have developed 500 products but I've done everything from buttons to like dolls 18 inch dolls so when you do buttons you're developing like 50 products a year when you do dolls you might be developing like 20 right a year I should say a season not a year so let's walk through my toy journey so in 2009 I worked at a company called Madame Alexander um, that was the coolest job ever. I thought all jobs in the toy industry were gonna be like this job from Madame Alexander, and they were not. Uh, I essentially was like a fashion designer for dolls. I would come in and my boss would say, okay, this is our theme. Our theme is nursery rhymes. Problem, we have been doing this theme for like 50 years. We have done all the nursery rhymes that exist. We need new ideas. I was an intern. 
They didn't expect me to do anything that would get landed in any books or like actually made, but I came up with a lot of ideas. I actually did six dolls in my three months there that were made. This is one of them. She is on top of spaghetti. She was very expensive for me to get a copy of, but she is adorable and a pride and joy. In 2010, I went to the Fashion Institute of Technology. I actually graduated in 2010. Um, and that's where I took a degree in toy design. So this picture is all of my classmates. Hope they don't mind me using this photo. <laughs> and we're with our toys that we created, the arrows pointing to me. And there's like a little pig. And if we go to the next slide, I think we'll get a close-up shot of that. So you might wonder, what was toy school like, Agel? Can I go to toy school? Yes, you can go to toy school. Most of the people that I was in class with were, this was not their first round of college. Most of these people already had careers, but they wanted to come back and jump into the toy industry. We drew a lot. Drawing was like the most important thing to be a toy designer in this major. I was not the best artist. This is some of my work. I had to learn. I had to work really hard to be able to express the ideas that I wanted to create. And we also made models. We made plastic prototypes, plush prototypes. So in 2000, what does that say? 2013, I uh, actually had my first patented item, and that was zip screens. And this is really great. I'm so glad I put this in because I heard yesterday you guys um, did some screen printing. So let's go to the next slide. And I want to tell you the story of zip screens. So I was working at a company, and the CMO comes to me and my boss, and he's like, hey, there's this company out there called Tulip. They are dominating the screen printing market, and we need to take over. We need to, we need to get in there. And they were like, what can you come up with? Innovation team, that was the team I was on. Like, what can you make? And we're like, OK, yeah, 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 we got this. So we spent like a month coming up with what you see up here, which was refashion. We were like, this is brilliant. We were coming out of a recession as a country. We're going to just rebrand screen printing to be like refashion. We pitch it. We'd done like this book you see here. We had a whole instruction manual. We did a whole what they call like a three foot display in the toy industry where you mock up a retail space. And the CMO looked at us and he was like, no, I hate it. Like, just I don't like it. Start over. And we were like, oh, OK, sure. So a 10 minute patented idea came out of all that um, weeks and weeks of work because I went back to my desk and my boss goes, Agile, let's take a break. We've been working on this too much, let's take a break. And I was like, no, we are not taking a break, okay? I have been living and breathing screen printing stuff. I've been researching. We're going to figure this out right now. Let's go to the next slide. And that's when Zip Screens was born. Literally, we sat down 10 minutes. We brainstormed um, what makes up screen printing. You guys know if you did it yesterday, the, you got the paint bottle, you got the squeegee, you got the frame, you got the design artwork, you got a lot going on. What if we could combine that all into one? You'll see this theme of combining things a lot in how I, how I brainstorm. Um, and that's where we created what you see in the bottom left here, the Zip Screens packet, where there's paint, there's a squeegee, um, all wrapped up into one, and you tear open the packet and you screen print right over a screen that sticks to your shirt. No frame, no bottle, no separate squeegee, no mess. The CMO loved it. It became Zip Screens, it was in Walmart, and this is one of my patents. Let's move on to the next slide. So going back to my toy journey, where, where did you go from there? 2015, I went and worked at a little company called Toys R Us. Dream job. I was so happy. I looked so scared in my first photo. Um, they take like a photo of you when you work at Toys R Us, like, you know, the bat employee badge. And I literally was like, I was terrified. Um, but it was a great job. I was the design manager for all the Girls World brands. What I'm holding there is a product I designed. It's like a little Vespa scooter for, scooter for Journey Girls, which is their 18 inch doll line. And let's, yes, yeah, so if you're wondering, like, what's it like to design toys, Agel? Well, it kind of looks like this. So I would come into work. They would say, this is the line of product we're going to make. I would sketch out some ideas. I'd say, OK, you want to make like a kitchen playset? What if it looked like this? And they'd say yes, or they say no. Usually they said no, I'll be real. But they say yes, or they say no. And then uh, we, I would move on from that sketch you see over there into something that's called like a like a plan drawing, that's not a simpler term for that, or like a front plan drawing where I'm adding in Pantone colors and patterns. This is done in Illustrator. And that's what we sent over to the factory. 
Once we sent that to the factory, the factory would send us back samples. Sometimes the samples would look good. Usually they looked bad. And then we would give back feedback and we'd say, yes, no, change this, change that. And, and that thus was the designing of toys at Toys R Us. Next slide. So then, in 2016, I got a little bit of a promotion. I was able to, uh, instead of doing design management, do product management for a brand called Totally Me. So what you see here is a craft desk for the brand Totally Me. Now, let's go into the next slide, because you might be wondering, oh, well, not yet, hold on. OK, so 2019, I, work, I moved on from Toys R Us and worked for a company called um, Creative Kids. At Creative Kids, I eventually became the VP of Brand and Product. As a VP of Brand and Product, I was doing all of the stuff I did for Toys R Us, like designing product, costing product. But I was also hiring a team to help me do that as well. Um, let's move on to the next slide. One moment. So I want to give you an example, a comparison of designing toys versus developing toys, because they're kind of different. And if you're like, I'm not an artist, I can't do this, you might be able to develop toys. So these are some behind the scenes photos of like the process of developing toys. In most companies, they divide this where the person developing the toys, the person who like goes to China, talks with the factory and says like, hey, factory, this is what our designers want to make. Can you help us? What can you do? And the factory says, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, here are the samples of what we built from what your designer sent us. And then the developer says, I don't know. They're not really catching their vibe here. And that's really what you do as a developer. Let's move on to the next slide. So after working for this company, Creative Kids, I moved on from that. We were in the middle of the pandemic. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm realizing how much I'm building someone else's dream, and I'm not building my own. I realized that because I was spending time at home with my now fiance, and I was like, wow, I never used to see him. I'm seeing him so much more now. I'm never home. What am I working for? And I said, you know what? I'm going to take a shot on my own dreams, and I started the toy coach. Um, let's see. Next slide. Yeah. So the journey of becoming the toy coach, it started with a toy podcast. And this podcast started because um, while I was working in the industry, an uh, inventor came up to me and they said, oh, I got this really good idea. I spent all my money on it. What do I do? And I was like, inventor, just like send me an email with all the information. I got you. I, I have the hookup. I will pitch you to my boss. If he likes it, let's do this. And she didn't know what to give me. She wasn't ready. It was all a mess. She really couldn't get it together. So I was like, let me help you. But I didn't help her fast enough. She went off and spent money with somebody else. And I thought, man, that was a missed opportunity for me. I need to make a resource. So I made this podcast. Got it approved by my boss. Made this podcast. Um, but then eventually left that company, kept the podcast. And then I started getting media coverage. Marie Forleo, I was on Access Daily a few times. And with that um, coverage, I built this program called Toy Creators Academy. Uh, all the people you see here so far, I've had 100 students, a little over 100 students. They are everything from like bakers, industrial engineers, mechanical engineers, scientists, um, artists, illustrators, all that have ideas for toys. They didn't know where to start, and they came to me, and they trusted me to give them an opportunity. Not only did I teach them everything I knew, but I created this thing called the TCA Virtual Pitch Event, where I, would, I reached out to my industry contacts, and I said, hey, Hasbro, I've got some people you need to meet. And uh, you know, thus, the whole Toy Coach, Toy Creators Academy saga was born. Let's keep on going. Um, so, so eventually, the toy industry started to take notice. A lot of people in the toy industry were like, who is this girl who looks 16? Thank you. Coming in here, talking about, I have 10 years of experience. And, but eventually, they understood like who I was, where I came from. I got all of these great accolades, one of them being um, this Taggy Award for being a change maker in the industry. Later, and I don't have an image of it, I won a Wonder Woman Award for being a great storyteller. Tell me if you think I deserve that. And then, let's move on to the next one. I was also on the History Channel. Um, I got really lucky, I got to say. One thing I'm going to tell you, if you're going to do something creative, you're going to make something, talk about it everywhere. The reason I got on the History Channel, this is not supposed to be in the conversation, but I have to tell you. Um, I posted about my podcast on, in a Facebook group about podcasts. Someone saw me there, we started a conversation, and it led to this, and so many other TV opportunities. So like post about your work. People need to see it. They need to hear your personal story. Let's move on to the next slide. Ah, yeah, so Access Daily. Um, 
you know, this was huge for me. Every time they call, I'm like, you guys want me back? Like, I'm so excited. I'm pumped. Yes, I'll come back. I have clips of Mario Lopez calling me a friend of the show. I will put that everywhere. And let's move on to the next slide. Some of my biggest achievements, though, came because I knew my zone of toy genius. So why don't we identify yours? So let's figure out your zone of toy genius. What could it be? If you're like, Ajal, I really don't want to design a toy. Too bad. You're with me. We're going to do this. Let's go. Q1. OK, question one. Have you ever had an idea for a toy? If you have, what category was that idea in? So categories like dolls, games, puzzles, I don't know, shout it out, role play, costumes. And ever had an idea for a toy? Shout it. Ever. Category. None? Stop it. Huh? Game, OK. Crafting toy. See, you guys are making me feel bad for a second. Keep going. <laughs> Stuffed animals. <laughs> me too. Coding. Coding? That would be good. You should do that. And OK, you had that idea for this toy. What is your specific skills and your unique knowledge? What is like the career you work in or the hobby you devote yourself to? So for me, for a long time, it was like sewing. and these pants. I made them. This is a pure example of that. But um, because of that uh, sewing thing, I was able to kind of rise up in, in a company I worked at as this person who knew everything about sewing. So like anytime they needed to like make a plush or like make a jewelry kit, they were like, Jill, you do it, you know? So what is your hobby or your professional experience that would make that you're an expert in? Shout it out. Are you a mechanical engineer? Are you a cake artist? Are you a woodwork? Oh, that's a good one. Okay. Early childhood development, very good, OK? And baby, baby inventions are like, they need more of them. So I don't know if you don't mean that early, but any more? Hmm? Crafting. I love, so that was my whole career for a very long time. So I love that. So next slide. So that is your, your zone of toy genius. You combine those two things. So if you, let's say, the, the example I usually like to give is, say you had an idea for a science toy. Um, and say you always get ideas for TV shows. This is actually an example of one of my students. Um, so say you are like a chemist. This is Keisha. She is a chemist. She just won a competition at the licensing expo in Las Vegas because she had an idea to create an animated character line called the Catoms. Very cool idea, all about cats and atoms and science and, uh, and elements and everything. Um, so that is your zone of toy genius. And you might not think it's anything special, but it is, and the toy industry needs it, because most people in the toy industry are like me. Like, we just do toys all the time. That's all we do. But people like you who come from the educator background, you might see toys out there today, and you're like, oof, that is not a good toy for my child. I could do a better toy. That's not a good to toy for my kid who's learning. Right? She's like, mm-hmm. She's like, I saw those toys. <laughs> so let's go to the next slide. Okay. So maybe you're thinking about your zone of toy genius. Maybe you found it here. Maybe you have to noodle on it a little bit more. But now, what do you do next? So now you're going to follow my three-step process to unlocking your creativity for, oh, the, the graphic's not working in here. Well, if the graphic was working, it would say innovative toys, products, art. Just, just imagine that's happening next to the word innovative, just like toy, product, art, right? I sent him a PDF, I forgot. OK, let's go to the next slide. So the first thing you're going to do, and this is the process that I teach in Toy Creators Academy. It's like a piece of it, obviously. It's not the whole thing, but can't go through all that in 20 minutes. But step one, <laughs> become a mini expert in the industry you want to innovate. So if you're inspired by what I'm saying today and you're like, Ajah, I want to innovate the toy industry. I want to do what you're help helping the people do. That's great. So you want to become a mini expert in the toy industry. If you're an educator and you're like, I'm just going to stay in my lane. I'm going to be all up in here in the education field. Great. Become a mini toy expert in that, a mini expert in the education field. And you might say, Ajal, I'm already an expert in the education field. Great. But what if you wanted to break into online education? That's a whole other vein of education. So become an expert in that online education field. Let's go to the next slide. So what I call the stage is market research. Why is it important? Before you innovate anything, you've really got to know who your competition is. 
Um, one of the biggest mistakes all my students uh, make before they come to me is they go to a company like Hasbro and they're like, oh my God, I have the best idea. The idea is there are gonna be dots on the floor. They're all gonna be like red, blue, yellow. There's a spinner. You spin the spinner, whatever dot you get, you put your hand on it and then Hasbro's like, we have Twister. So that's what you don't want to do, right? You don't want to be the person who's coming up with ideas that already exist. So you want to get to know your market. You want to learn those rules before you break them, and you want to find what we call in the toy industry the white space. That's like, you know, the opportunity. So one opportunity that was really prevalent um, in the news recently was um, black dolls. There weren't enough of them. So we saw there were a lot of white dolls out there placed everywhere in all the stores and people were saying there's not enough black dolls for my black daughters opportunity that's what you're going to find are there not enough toys that represent children with disabilities are there not enough you know toys for for blind kids that's actually something a friend just keeps texting me about she's like Ajelle when are you going to make a toy for my blind stepson and I'm like I'm I'm busy but I will I will get on it very soon but where do you go to do this market research so for my students, I have them go to toy stores, right? So I say, you guys got to go to Learning Express. You got to go to Lego. I like them to go to Whole Foods for like packaging inspiration. FAO Schwartz, I like you to look on Amazon. We'll talk about why later. But for you guys, if you're educators and you're seeing this trend of like online education and you're like, I want a piece of that pie, you might look on Udemy. You might look at Masterclass. You should definitely check out Not So Wimpy Teacher if you don't know what that is for online education. Um, if you are like an artist, you might want to look at DesignerCon. You also might want to look at YouTube. Let's go to the next slide. And while you're looking, you have to ask yourself certain questions like, um, how are they engaging the kids in education? What topics are they covering? What products do they have? What products are the best? What things do people buy the most of? What's top rated? What's bottom rated? And most importantly, what is missing? So I want you to introduce you to Julie. Julie is a student of mine. She um, is a child psychologist. And she created this thing here that's called Dealing in Feelings. So Julie works with children with developmental disabilities. And she said that she was trying to help them understand their emotions. And she didn't have the right tools to do it with. There were all these cards out there, like matching cards with faces of adults and different emotions, like happy and sad, but none with kids' faces on them. So she created that. She's already an expert in her field, like many of you are, and she saw an opportunity to create a product that, is it a toy? Is it a kid's product? It falls in that vein of the kids and entertainment industry, and she created a product, and it is selling very well on Amazon and on her own site. Next slide. So. Let's go back to the three steps of unlocking creativity. Step number two, find out what your audience actually wants. So how do you do this? You are going to ask questions, and then you're going to listen when they give you the answers to those questions. So this is a picture of me in this sequin pants that I'm wearing today because this is the last time that I completely ignored my audience. And I, I love to tell the story so that people don't make the same mistake. Um, I was this, so I created a costume line called Costumize Me, had a whole reason, that's for another speech, another day. But when I was fitting a friend of mine in these pants, and I was like, I just need to get the fit right, I want to come, can you come, let me test you, she said, where are you going to sell these? And I said, oh, my own website, of course, of course, Shannon. And she said, really? I feel like this is something that should be on Etsy. And I was like, Shannon, you don't know. I was like, I have in my head, I didn't say this, so I would never say, now she's gonna see this video and she's gonna be like, oh, really? But no, I, I said, Shannon, you, you don't know. I was like, I've been researching this. I know where I'm gonna go with my leggings. If I put it on Etsy, I have to share some of the profit with Etsy. I don't wanna do that. I didn't listen to Shannon. Shannon went home. I struggled to sell these leggings, <laughs> like so hard. I spent like hundreds, Let's be real, it got to thousands on Facebook ads trying to sell these leggings. And then like two years later, I put them on Etsy and sold in like two days my first pair. So the lesson here is listen to your audience. So how are you gonna find out what your audience wants? 
you're going to ask them. You're going to do surveys. I teach people to do Google form surveys. They're super easy. But the questions you want to ask are not questions like, do you like these leggings? It's like, where would you go to buy these leggings? Where would you go to learn this lesson? Where would you go to shop for this toy? Why would you shop for this toy? Who would buy something like this, if anyone? You also will want to look at online reviews. This is my favorite tip. I love this tip. I'm sorry, I skip focus groups, but I love online reviews. So say you're creating a competitive product, and whether it's like an educational course or you're creating like a physical product, there's usually a way to find reviews. The reviews you want to pay attention to are the reviews that have three stars. People that leave three-star reviews tend to be, they give a lot of really good information. They're really on the fence. They're not like fangirls, but they're not like haters. So they're going to tell you exactly how it is. They're going to be like, oh, this product was good, but I was expecting X, Y, and Z. That X, Y, and Z is what you put into your product so you can make it better. Also, you'll ask family and friends for their opinion, but take it with a grain of salt because they love you and they'll say whatever you want. But tip for you is I want you to pay attention to when people express how they feel about a product, write that down, highlight it, and circle it. Emotions goes back to the beginning of this conversation when we talked about experiences, why you remember that toy you loved so much as a kid. Whenever somebody tells you the emotion a product made them feel relieved, happy, excited, you know, surprised, those are the things that you want to make sure your product has. Those are the things you want to communicate about your product whenever you're trying to sell it. If you're pitching it, if you're teaching it, if you're trying to sell it at a trade show, the emotion is really what you want to pay attention to. So I'm curious if you guys have anything for me. Um, has your audience ever told you they need something specific? Maybe kids that you're teaching, um, maybe people you create art for, maybe your kids and some of your parents? And he's like, yes, what? Sometimes a product exhibit goes from point A to completely different point Z at the end with the same outcome. What's the top thing they said that they say that they want? Or the thing you get the most often, the feedback you get the most often? Uh, usually it's, uh, it's not so much like a verbal, but it's breakable. Like, the, like it breaks easier than they thought, so they're like, oh, you got to make this stronger. That's they, want they want durability. They want durability, yeah. So if you're designing an exhibit, then the situation would you would go into is the next time you do marketing materials about that exhibit or the new exhibit, you would say, oh, my, our most durable exhibit yet. You can just throw your kids at it and it will stay up, right? That, That's actually one of the tests. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I don't, I'm sorry. If anyone else had any answers, we have to end there because that was too good. We got, I'm sorry. Next, next slide. So I want to introduce you guys to Nicole. Also a student of mine, she's an agile project manager. I also barely know what that means. I think she works in software development. She's OK, that's right. So Nicole noticed a lack of high quality black heirloom dolls when she was looking for one for her daughter. Um, heirloom dolls meaning they're, they're made out of like yarn. You keep them for a long time. So what did Nicole do? She created them. She created her very own heirloom dolls, and she got them into a toy store. She also won plenty of grants, grants from Amazon. Not sure where the other ones were from, but she got them into a toy store. Now finally, let's move on to step three of this creativity unlocking magic that I'm going to teach you today. And what I teach in my program is something called toy math. But we're going to make an educator math here today. I'm going to do a dance routine. You'll see it shortly. Um, so you can use a version of toy math to brainstorm what I call layered ideas. So what is toy math? Um, toy math mixes up the elements and play patterns of toy creation to inspire new ideas. So I have some examples up there for you, like Monopoly plus the Nailed It TV show might create a board game where the goal is to build a cake empire. An actual real-world example of this is the top example here. My fiance works for this company. What do you mean on the right? So I know this is a fact. Um, the game What Do You Mean was inspired by looking at the existing game Cards Against Humanity and the popularity of memes. Thus came the game 
What Do You Mean, which was like a top number one bestseller for so many years in the toy industry, and it changed the game in the toy industry. People, the, the price of board games, I believe, went up because of What Do You Mean? Nobody would spend the kind of money uh, at retail that customers would spend until What Do You Mean? Let's do another example of toy math. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen this game. This is actually a, a knockoff version of it. I don't know why I always pull up the knockoff version. So it's actually called Connect for Blast, I believe, or Bounce. I don't know. So it's a combination of Pong. Let's not say what kind of Pong, but Pong, <laughs> plus Connect Four. And it is one of Hasbro's great selling games. It made a splash at the Toy Fair where it de debuted. It, it adds action and anticipation to Connect Four, like a physical activity. You can add drinks on top of it, lemonade if you're young. But let's keep going. How can an educator apply this? Well, so I had this high school teacher, and while I was writing this, I was like, oh, I'm so happy it popped into my head. Her name is Mrs. O'Brien. She's now the head of math at the high school I went to. And her problem was math was boring and no one would pay attention. But she was like the best math teacher. I had an A in all, like, all of her classes. She was amazing. So what she did is she combined boring math with something that wasn't boring. So this, this is literally what she used to do. I'm going to do a little demo. So it was like known throughout our school that this would happen when you got to like pre-cal with her. Um, she would get to teaching us about asymptotes, and she would do this. If it cancels, it's a hole. If it doesn't cancel, it's an asymptote. If it cancels, it's a hole. If it doesn't cancel, it's an asymptote. I have no idea what an asymptote is. I have no idea what a hole is. But if I were in a situation where somebody is going to say, it, does it cancel if it's an asymptote or a hole, I know. Because of Mrs. O'Brien combining some things with toy math. Next slide. So she combined some dance moves with toy math and a little bit of like rhythm, and she would repeat it. It was literally one class where she did this. But it stuck in not only my mind, Everybody at this high school talked about Miss O'Brien and her dance and the asymptotes and the whole, everyone knew. So I want you to think about using toy math in your education. Like, can you use educator math? So you might be wondering this three-step process that I taught just now. Does it really work, Agile? Have you ever used it? Well, yes, I have. So um, this five-in-one friendship bracelet creator is something that I made oh, a while ago, but it was another patented item. And how it came about is the CMO of this company came to me uh, and my whole, my whole innovation team, and he said, hey, Zhao, we need to go up in the friendship bracelet market. There are two-in-one friendship bracelet makers. There are three-in-one friendship bracelet makers. They are killing it. They are dominating. We need to dominate. I said, OK, I got you. So I did step one which is um, doing that initial market research. I was a pro in my industry already, but I did some extra research on friendship bracelets. Why did people love them so much? Got to know my audience, read a lot of reviews. People said, oh my God, I love the variety of friendship bracelets that I can create, and it's so easy. I love it, I don't have to use my drawer anymore. And then I used toy math, and I combined all of these different types of bracelets. So I met with a jewelry designer that worked at the company. I asked her to show me every kind of friendship bracelet maker, friendship bracelet you can create with thread. And then I asked her to show me all the tools that she used to create those bracelets. And I sat there with her and I said, OK, if I took this piece off this tool and I put it on this tool, would this still work? And she'd say, yes. I'd say, OK, if I took this piece and put it on this tool, would it still work? And she'd be like, no. And I'd say, OK, OK. What if we did this? What if we did that? We did that trial and error. We kept, we layered like how you create all these friendship bracelets. We made what is called the breadboard maca, what you see in the, the, top, the bottom left, out of foam core, this idea. And eventually, that became the friendship bracelet creator. It was sold a bunch of places. I know Walmart, maybe Target, not sure. Um, but that's what that became. Let's go. So final recap. We learned three steps. Number one, market research. Number two, get to know your audience. Really listen to what they say to you when you ask them questions. Number three, toy math, or your version of it. I would love to go to some Q&A, if that slide would like to work. No? All right. Thank you. Hope you enjoyed that. <laughs>
So thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, I actually wanted, want to go ahead and be selfish. I'm going to ask a question that I have. Uh, so I uh, make a lot of different things. Uh, and, and while I have some ideas for toys, but I also have uh, a, pro a prototype of a thing that I'm actively working on and have been for a little over a year. And I sold out because I hit my own problem after doing, uh, so I, I have done some amount of market research. But as I'm prototyping this thing, I don't know what level of finish the thing that I have needs to be before I can take it to someone. So it depends on what you want to do with it. This is a great, another great talk topic, but it's um, there are like kind of three paths in the toy industry I teach. Do you want to be an inventor? Do you want to be an entrepreneur? Or do you want to be a corporate toy person? So if you want to be an inventor, um, when you develop an idea, you really just need it to show proof of concept. That's the term, that the industry recognized term, proof of concept. So um, what I showed earlier in the slides, which was the breadboard mock-up of the jewelry, yeah, that breadboard mock-up, it worked. It, you could literally make the five friendship bracelet makers on that foam board mock-up. It would fall apart pretty easily and eventually it'd be very delicate with it, but it worked. That is the level that you would have to take something if you wanted to show it to a toy company for potentially a licensing deal. And that's what inventors do. They get licensing deals uh, from toy companies. So say an inventor sold that idea to a toy company, the toy company would say, okay, great. We will give you 3% of our sales um, for everyone we sell this to. Uh, and you would just kind of give them that prototype. You'd sign some paperwork and you'd give them the patent. You'd sign, well, you wouldn't give them the patent. You would hold the patent, but they would have rights to it for a certain amount of time. If you were going the entrepreneur route, that's a different story. If you were going to show it to like um, a factory so that they can manufacture it for you, you want it to be, and this would have to go way back, so let's not do that, but earlier in the, in the show, in the show, earlier in the talk, I showed you like um, this. I showed, I don't know if you can see this here, but I showed you like dolls that I'd created. And I showed you, yeah, it's like page something. I don't know what page it is, I can't tell. Yeah, yeah, so like, if you were gonna go to a factory, what you really want is like a plan drawing, and actually there's more to this that's not here, where I showed the dolls without clothes, front, back, and side view. Then you wanna get really detailed, like with measurements, because you don't want the factory to mess that up. Um, so yeah. Thank you for that. You're welcome. And uh, am I right in an understanding of like, the that inventor route requires less on front, but gets less back in the long run, and then the entrepreneur route requires more upfront risk and investment? Yes. yes, yeah, definitely. But there are inventors who invest too much. That's why I do what I do and um, try to tell people, like, spend as little as possible when you're going and inventing product to license to toy companies because the invention rate at big companies, um, the rate at which they license product is 3%. So Mattel and Hasbro have come on record saying we get like 3,000 submissions a year and we, we manufacture three to five of those. So you don't want to spend a ton of money um, inventing for licensing. But So if you keep your costs down and you do breadboard mock-ups, yes, it can be cheaper, but some people spend too much. Yeah. If you have a game idea but it's based on a, Existing a game? show that's oh. on TV, do you have to approach the show owners first and then um, yeah. try to market it or put it out there? or Yeah, so that's a great question. So usually toy companies are not going to be as interested in licensing an idea that would require them to put another license on top of it. Because you have to imagine like a toy company manufactures a board game for 250 If they have to give you 2% and they have to give Blue's Clues 2%, what are they left with? It's not even 2%. Blue's Clues would probably be like 10%. You probably would be like 3%. So what are they left with? You know, they still have to do, um, they still have to pay for liability. They still have to pay for shipping. They, like, they won't do that. So when you're de developing a game, it's more about the mechanics of the game. Mechanics meaning like how, like so say it's Candyland. You're going from start to finish the candy castle or whatever it is. So how do you get to the candy castle? That's the mechanics. Are you rolling dice? Are you rushing to finish like a, a something, like a cards in order? Um, is there, I don't know, I always talk about this toy um, that like has like poop flying out of like a toilet seat. It's so funny. Um, so like, is there like some mechanism that will surprise like a kid because like a little plastic poop will fly out or like a daddy will wake up, like, you know, don't, don't wake daddy the game. 
So it's really about the mechanism of how players win. What are the steps? It shouldn't be based on the license. If your idea is based on the license, it's not quite innovative enough. But don't get discouraged. But Michelle, yeah. I think it's a pro for kids that want to develop because they have like the toy box, right? Um, I feel like in my experience, so let me think back. Because when I was at Horizon, we didn't have that. But by the time I'd gone to Creative Kids, we did have that. Um, but honestly, I don't know if it's changed since I left Creative Kids. But with Creative Kids, what I found was I was able to have an idea, sketch it out, send it to a 3D modeler who was in like Russia. She would send back like a design and then I could print it in the office um, and move a little bit faster. The caveat being um, it wasn't always smooth. So like I wouldn't have the time to sand it down and spray paint it if I wanted to take it to a meeting. But sometimes we would just take like the raw sample to a meeting. So I guess I'm saying all this to say, like it did speed up the process to be able to pitch ideas but then i what i remember would happen is we would pitch ideas that we hadn't priced yet because i was printing them and i was like yeah this should totally be 10 cents and then china would be like no it isn't so you know it helped but then it also created other problems um, but it's great for trade shows because when you're doing like last minute trade shows especially right now with a shipping crisis you can't wait for samples to come in so you just like print whatever you can print you're like that's what's going to go on the show and we're just going to sell off that so yes and no yes and no okay Oh, well, okay, I wasn't involved. I'll tell you one I wasn't involved in and then one I hope will be a hit because now it's gonna be in stores that I was involved in. So one I wasn't involved in was Pie Face. Do you remember that? Yeah, so it, it made the rounds in the toy industry and everyone said no. <laughs> and then it went viral and Hasbro was like, well, hold on, let's revisit that, that item that came in here. Um, so yeah, it went viral and it was really natural. Like it was the, this video of this kid like laughing with his like grandpa and like he was going hysterical. So once it went viral, Hasbro was like, oh, let's let's have another conversation and license it. And what, what's happened since then is like toy companies will really pay attention if you have a, a Kickstarter that generates like $100,000 or more, or if you gain some virality online like Fugglers did, um, they were able to license it because they gained some virality online. So pie face. One I was involved in, which I only started this like uh, one and a half, two years ago. I don't know how long it's been. Um, but one of my students, Chrissy Fagerholt, shopped this idea around called the lunchroom game. I actually was her agent. Um, you can work with an agent to shop, shop ideas around for you, shopping it around for her to my friends and contacts in the industry. And everyone said no, and it was a great game. It's this nostalgic, and the timing was perfect. And there was one company who loved it, but they had a similar uh, product, like a similar agreement out already, where they're like, oh, we can't take this one too, because we're already kind of working on something similar. Eventually, Christy was like, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to give myself the yes. And she went and started working with a distributor. And that distributor is helping her get that product out. And now it is going to be in Barnes & Noble, I believe, in June. Um, so buy it. And then, we can, then I can say that that was a success that I helped with and that people ignored. So the lunchroom game. OK, yeah, go ahead. So is it like a game for just like OK. OK, what's the game? So the lunchroom game, it's like a game for like four to six players. Uh, the, all players get like a, a literally a lunchroom tray, um, and the goal is to fill your lunchroom tray with like your main course, your side dishes, your dessert. Um, there, it's like a it's a little bit of a chance and a little bit of strategy. It has a fun surprise anticipation element where like you're pulling from a deck of cards to see like did I get a main course, did I get a side dish, did I get a dessert? But then there are like random cards in there that are like the lunch lady card, and now you have to like throw your whole tray away, or like the janitor card, and now you have to like I don't know clean up spilled beans or something. But the really fun part is the tater tot card. When you get the tater tot card, everybody has to grab for these like tater tot squishies and then like throw them at each other. Uh, it's like really fun. Actually, I don't know if they're supposed to throw them at each other, but I did. So, <laughs> but the, la the person who doesn't get a tater tot squishy then has to like dump out all their cards and kind of start over. 
Uh, so that's the game, Barnes & Noble. EAP Toys & Games is the company that my student created to launch that game. Jelle, thank you so much for being here today. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much.